First Timothy chapter three. Thank you, Brother John. First Timothy chapter three. If you would pray for my dad, I'd really appreciate it. He was scheduled to be here in Illinois in a couple weeks to preach a, a revival meeting over in Baileyville, but he canceled that. He's been in the hospital for four days. Um, they were talking about releasing him, but then his oxygen levels were not good today, and uh, they might release him tomorrow after my mom gets off work in the afternoon, um, but they might even send him home with oxygen. So I don't know. I don't know what to think, you know. I'm not there. My brother said that he seemed to be in good spirits today this morning when when he went by and visited him and so if you would pray for him I would really appreciate it and uh we're just praying for for God to uh obviously do his will amen and so we'd like to see him get healed um he's scheduled to be here in September if he can make it to preach for our 10 year anniversary uh revival and I hope that he's able to come at that time. So continue to pray for him if you would. Of course, Miss Doris, um, Brother Ken um, had those those blood clots in his lungs this week. Miss Teresa's under the weather. Brother Dan's under the weather. Y'all need to keep your sicknesses away, you know. Maybe. <laughs> thank you for not bringing them and sharing them, I guess. I ought to, I ought to just thank, thank, thank the Lord that those people that are sick didn't come. Amen. Um, but honestly, uh, I hate to see people gone, people missing. And I know they hate to be gone too. You know, it's a really sad thing if we just kind of get into the rut of being gone and don't care. But it is, it is something that, you know, like my dad, he's really struggling with not going to church, you know, every time the doors are open. Um, but he just can't right now. And he needs to, he needs to understand that. Um, he's been going to church for 60, what, 60 three years or something like that, pretty much every time the doors are open. And so um, every once in a while, you kind of have to understand that God knows where you're at and what's going on in your life. And so if you'd pray for him, I'd appreciate it. It, it does mean a lot to me. And um, I know that we've been praying for others' health as well, other people's that are, have family members' health, Brother Jeff's dad and, and several others. Please keep those folks in prayer. Uh, Eddie also today was sick. So keep him in mind in prayer as well. First Timothy chapter 3, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus." These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory." I want us to notice in verse 15, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We've been talking about what it means to be a part of an independent fundamental Baptist church. Uh, what, what, does, 
the name mean? What does that look like in practice? And so we're going to talk about tonight what it looks like in practice to be an independent fundamental Baptist. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the people of God. We thank you for the spirit of God that uh, goes before us and leads us and guides us into all truth and speaks to our hearts. We ask that you would uh, speak to each of us tonight, Lord, that we would be instructed and that we would be helped. Please bless now uh, the preaching of your word. Please also bless the voting of mission on, on taking on missionaries as well as increasing the support of others at the end of the service. Lord, we want uh, your missionaries to be well taken care of. We want them to be able to fulfill the ministry that you've instructed of them. And so, Lord, we ask that you would encourage them and help them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've looked over the last several weeks what it means to be uh, independent, what it means to be autonomous, what it means to be fundamental, what it means to be a local Baptist church. And I hope that you have learned some things about the Baptist distinctives as well as the fundamentals of the faith upon which our church has been established. I believe it's very important for us to understand that uh, words mean something. If we didn't believe that words meant something, then we could just use any old Bible version that we wanted to. And we wouldn't care. Uh, if, 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 uh, if words didn't mean anything, then it wouldn't matter what our church is called, and it wouldn't matter uh, what kind of terms that we use in relation to ministry. But I believe that terms matter, words matter. I believe that it's important for us to be biblically and doctrinally correct. And I believe that it's very important for us to be a Baptist church. What does it mean to be a Baptist? It means that we're Bible believers. It means that we believe in the autonomy of the local church. It means that we believe in the priesthood of all believers. It means we believe that there are two ordinances of the church and neither one of them will save you, but both of them are representative of what Christ did for us. It means that we believe in individual soul liberty, that everybody will stand before God and give an account for themselves and that we all should worship God according to our own conscience. We believe that it means that there should be a saved and baptized church membership only and that people should not be a part of a church unless they're a part of the church, uh, the body of Christ. You can't be a part of the body of Christ unless you're in Christ and Christ is in you. We believe that there are two offices only, pastor and deacon, that we find in the scriptures. There's not a pope, a monsignor, a bishop. There's not an a archbishop. There's not all these different ter terms and titles that are established by man making it more of a military or a governmental hierarchy than it was supposed to be, which is a church, which is a local body identified for the furtherance of the gospel. We believe that there should be a, a, a saved and baptized church membership and that we should be separated from the, the, there should be separation from the church and the state. Not that the state uh, should, should not be influenced by the church, but that the state should not run the church and that the church should not run the state. It does not mean that we as the church should not vote. We're members of our community. We should vote, and we should vote our consciences, and we should vote biblically. We should vote according to what God says about things, not according to what our pocketbook says about things. Far too many people are always looking for what a government subsidy or program will do for them or, or what some candidate will say or... or Pledge to do for them rather than just voting according to what God's word says. We should never vote for anything that would be uh, killing of, of either babies or seniors. Uh, we, we, we should never ha ever vote for a candidate that believes that it's okay for a uh, person to take a life that God has given to them and butcher it. I believe that. I also believe that we should vote for righteousness when it comes to marriage and family. I believe, I, I, look, I know that there are different people who have different views and different lifestyles, but that does not make them righteous. It does not make it holy and it does not make it good for our community. I am not, I'm not against anybody. I'm not, I'm not hateful towards anybody that does not have a proper perspective on uh, marriage or even on what God says about adultery or fornication. I love them. God loves them. He wants them to be saved. Amen. Amen. You don't think that God wants those who are, who are deep in sexual sins to be saved? Aren't you glad he got you? 
Maybe he got you while you were in sin, or maybe he got you before you went in sin, but I'm glad he got you. You realize that all of us have the capability of walking away from the truth of the Word of God and getting ourselves knee-deep, neck-deep into sin. Every one of us. There are plenty of former preachers out there living in gross, wicked immorality tonight. Don't think that it couldn't happen to any of us. So before we start pointing our finger at everybody and talking about how great a sinner they are, we need to really point our finger at him and say how great of a Savior he is. Amen. But that does not mean that it's okay for us to live in a society that says that homosexual marriage is marriage. It's not marriage. God designed man for woman and woman for man, and he's the one that, that established that. And so, uh, like I said, I, I, don't, I try not to get too political, but I will tell you this. We have to be paying attention as church members to the political climate around us. And we've got to vote and we've got to be involved in politics because when uh, the only thing that it takes for evil to succeed is that good men do nothing. Amen. Wickedness is always going to be among us because there are a lot of people that do not believe in God and do not love God. And so we as God's people must claim the truth and believe the truth and live the truth. And so we are to uh, be involved in matters of the state, but the state is not supposed to be involved in matters of the church. We don't have a church that is running the state, and we don't have a state that's running a church. That's what we believe as Baptists. <clears throat> but tonight I want to look at some trademarks of what we are practically as an independent fundamental Baptist church. What does it look like in a practical way? What difference does it make? Why are we Baptist? We talked about the Baptist distinctives. Why are we fundamentalists? We talked about the fundamentals of the faith. And what does it mean to say I'm a part of an independent fundamental Baptist church? I believe it means, number one, that we believe in ecclesiastical separation. Ecclesiastical separation. We spoke a couple weeks ago about the reasons for being independent and autonomous in local churches. But we believe as Baptists that it's not just that we should not join a uh, nationwide or a worldwide denomination or a convention, but we also believe that there ought to be a separation between those that are doctrinally sound and those that are doctrinally in error. We believe that as a Baptist church that we're not looking for the other churches around town so that we can find our common ground and come together and perform things. It's not about... Uh, putting forth a better face towards the lost community. It's about pleasing God. I am for us reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am for us being charitable towards those that believe the fundamentals of the faith and, and those who stand in the truth of the doctrine of God's word. But we've got to be very cautious that we do not overlook huge doctrinal error just because we're trying to have friends. We believe as Baptists in not joining up with those who are in theological error. We don't hold citywide campaigns with those who do not hold our distinctives and our doctrine. I am not opposed to citywide campaigns. I'm not. I'm really not. But I am opposed to the fact that we would sit along the platform with people that, that believe in baptismal regeneration, with people that believe that sprinkling babies is going to save somebody, with people that believe in, in, in a false uh, doctrine as far as salvation, either work salvation or some sort of a uh, exclusion of others according to the word, the, they, they say according to the word of God. I don't believe that we should join up with those people and say we're all standing in solidarity and unity. We as Baptists believe in ecclesiastical separation and we get a bad name for it from a lot of people. But I'm okay with that. Because I'm not going to stand before them someday at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm going to stand before the Lord. And we as a church need to understand it's not about trying to put forth uh, a, 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 uh, a unified front towards the world around us. Although we should dwell charitably. We should love one another. Here in Shalom, I know you're my disciples when you have love one for another. We shouldn't hate somebody who's trying to do something for the cause of Christ. But we should understand that we're not going to capitulate or strive to find common ground with churches of other denominations simply because we want to make what we would consider to be more of a difference. 
I'll tell you this, the church of Jerusalem didn't go out and join all the Jews and try to figure out how they were going to make a difference better with those that still believed in the law. They didn't go and find those people that were, that were still trying to follow the ordinances of the law and say, hey, why don't you join up with us and you do your thing and we'll do our thing, but we'll have a united front and we'll reach the lost. Guess what? If we join up with somebody who does not believe in the true separation of, of, of God's word and God's ways from the other things of the world, then we're going to cause ourselves confusion. We're going to cause the people in our churches confusion. They're not going to know where we stand on certain issues, and we need to stand with the word of God. So we believe in ecclesiastical separation. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Paul the Apostle is writing to the churches at Galatia. And he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be a curse. If somebody, if another church is out there preaching a different gospel, then we don't want to join up with them. We want to be what some would call separatists. We want to be exclusionary. But we want to make sure that we are doctrinally sound. The word of God matters. And if it doesn't matter, then why, then, then why do we, why, why? I don't understand why somebody wants to claim to be a Baptist that doesn't believe in biblical authority. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. We've got to be very cautious that we don't join up with somebody who sounds good and looks good, but isn't good. They serve not the Lord Christ, but their own belly. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-3 through 3 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall de depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. There are churches who claim to be Christian in origin, but they claim that you're not supposed to eat meats, that you're supposed to follow the law, that you're supposed to meet on Saturdays. Uh, they, 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 they say that they preach a true gospel, but they truly preach a works salvation, and they want you to believe that they're just like you, but they're not. And so we've got to be very cautious that we don't join up with those who seem to have a lot of things in common with us, but they're not biblically based, and they do not rightly divide the word of truth. We need to have ecclesiastical separation what does it also mean, some trademarks of being an independent Baptist? Secondly, we don't believe in just ecclesiastical separation, but we believe in personal sanctification separation. We believe in personally being pure. We believe in not just doctrinal purity in the church, but personal and practical purity and separation from the world in the lives of all members. We believe in allowing each person to grow in grace and giving them some space so that they might grow. But we also recognize that in Matthew as well as in the book of Corinthians and other scripture passages that there is accountability in the church because we're interdependent upon the body of Christ. I might be the hand and you might be the foot, but we need each other. And we need to make sure that everybody in the church is not holding back other people in the church by living in sin. We find in the book of Corinthians that there was a man in the church and the people of God there in the church at Corinth, they, they came behind to no gift. They were gifted Christians and, and God had blessed them in great ways, but they were rather rejoicing that this man was living in sin and being okay with it. They were saying, thank God for grace. This man was living with his father's wife. And Paul said, I, I can't believe that you would let that slide. That wouldn't even be normal or right in the world that doesn't know God, that a man would have his father's wife. I don't think he was living with his own mother, but he was living with a stepmother. He was living in, in adultery and fornication in sin with a woman who was not his wife, and the church was just let it slide. 
But the Bible tells us that we're not to allow sin to continue in the church. And we're to make sure that there's church discipline and we push them out for a time so that they might understand that they need the church. They need the brothers and sisters in Christ to hold them accountable and to love them and to edify them and encourage them. And we don't push people out because we want them to stay out. We push them out for a time so that they come back with humility and with, with, with for, um, uh, uh, c- c- repentance and contrition so that they might become back a part of the body of Christ and a member in good standing. We need to understand that we're recognized, we're responsible to follow the Bible, not just to give credence to it, but to actually live it. And that happens from pastor to deacon to everybody in the church. We found here in in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the passage that we read, we found that the bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house. And I'm working on it. Y'all pray for me. My kids need some help. I let two of them go with the Campbells today, so hopefully they were good for y'all. Amen. Woo. Listen, um, none of us are perfect, but all of us ought to be striving to be morally and uh, morally right and, and, and practically right as Christians. Given to hospitality, apt to teach, of good behavior, vigilant, sober. These things are, uh, we're to be serious minded. We're supposed to love God and love others and do right and Please, please the Lord and, and, and we'll please the Lord when we treat others the way they're supposed to be treated. But we also believe that personal sanctification is to live lives free from sin and we ought to live holy as unto the Lord because without holiness no man shall see the Lord and we want other people around us to know who God is. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 1 through 12 we find... Uh, It's just some practical things that Paul says to the church at Ephesus. He says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice uh, to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint's. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. That is written to the church of God. We saw in Ephesians chapter 1 when we were going through Ephesians that it was written to the church at Ephesus as well as all those who are called to be saints, all those that are, that are saints of God. So God has written to us as the church that we're to live righteously and soberly and godly. We believe in personal sanctification. We ought to live in a way that is separate from the world. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God wants us to come out from among the world and be separate. I know that this isn't popular preaching, but it's truth. 
And that's what we want. Don't we want the truth? We shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. And if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And we want to be free from the world, free from the flesh. We want to be able, and guess what? We're not going to be completely free until we spend eternity in heaven with God. But until then, we're supposed to walk in truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. Paul is writing again to the church at Corinth, and he says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. He says, There is no such thing as a law that, that, that over, over, uh, overwhelms my life. I, I, am, I am not living by a law. I'm living by the life of Jesus Christ. He said, So there are some things that, that, that the law does not forbid of me to do. By the way, there's a lot of things that are legal in our society, but they're not good for a Christian to do. I don't care if they legalize marijuana. It's not okay for a Christian to come under the power of a substance. Just like it's not good for a Christian to be drunk with wine. We're in his excess, but we're supposed to be filled with the Spirit. So I don't care if it's legal. It doesn't make it right. Okay? So there's a lot of things that are legal. I mean, you can go out here and you can have an affair. You can break the bounds of your marriage and just because you're not going to go to prison for that does not make it right. Amen. All of us are to live righteously. That's what the Bible tells us. Uh, We find here, all things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought into the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. You know, God didn't give you your body so you could pleasure yourself. He gave you your body so you could pleasure him, please him. Amen? You're supposed to be living to please God, not living to please you. Okay, I'll come down there and sit down there again and say amen to myself. Now the body is not for fornication. God hath raised... Both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. No, it says if, if you go into a harlot and you have Uh, improper relationships with them it is just like you have entered into a marriage bed with a harlot you are saying that you can feasibly do falsehood and wrong with somebody that is wicked and and just be just fine because well there's no law there's no real law against it the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. I have life in Christ, and therefore I have a better life to live than I had when I was lost. Amen. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. What, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I will tell you this. Seems like the world around us, the only thing that really matters to most people is intimacy. I want to be careful, we've got children here. Everybody, it seems, around us is living for one thing. That's why people dress the way they do. That's why people drink the way they do. That's why people get, get high the way they do. That's why the p- people uh, go and, and, and get involved in the things that they get involved with because that seems to be the ultimate goal of almost everybody in our society is that they can have some sort of relationship tonight. And the Bible says, hey, it's, it's been going on for a lot longer than just this generation, but you're God's. You're not the world's, you're not the flesh, you're not the devil's. You're God's. Let's live properly, appropriately, personally sanctified. Amen. All right, number three. What is a trademark of being an independent Baptist? We believe not only in ecclesiastical separation, not only in personal uh, sanctification, we, we believe in evangelistic soul winning. 
We believe that it's our responsibility as God's people to tell the people of the world around us that Jesus loves them and that he wants them to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We believe that it's our responsibility for every Christian to be a witness. It's not that we pay the preacher to witness for us. It's that we all witness. It's that we all come together and understand that I'm an ambassador for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be you reconciled to God because we've got a ministry of reconciliation that's been given to us. The Great Commission was given, and some people would say, well, the Great Commission was given to the apostles and the disciples, and they went out and they did it, and the gospel went into all the world, and now we don't have to do it anymore. We don't believe that. We believe that this generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of lost people. That every Christian this side of heaven is responsible for every lost person this side of hell. That we should believe that we ought to preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, We find all all throughout the scriptures, and Paul went here and preached the gospel. And Paul went here and preached the gospel. And Peter went here and preached the gospel. And and, and Silas went here and preached the gospel. And Barnabas went here and preached the gospel. And we ought to go everywhere preaching the gospel. We believe that. The Great Commission is our great mission. It's been committed to us. I I believe I'm responsible for people around me. Paul believed he was responsible for people around him. We find over in Acts chapter 20, he said that that I'm free for the blood of all men. Where did he get that? How about over in Ezekiel when it says that that if you don't warn somebody as a watchman that their blood will be on your hands. He says, I have no blood on my hands because I have warned those around me. He believed the Old Testament truth about telling people about God. You could say, well, we're New Testament Christians. Yes, we are. And we find all throughout the New Testament people preaching and people telling the truth about Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you at this time, faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, just like it came by hearing the word of God then. But how shall they hear without a preacher? We're supposed to be preachers. We believe in evangelistic soul winning. I will tell you this. All of us are going to give an account someday for why we did not share the gospel with somebody. I guarantee it. It's going to be a sad day. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus who died upon the cruel tree to think of his great sacrifice at Calvary. I know my Lord expects the best from me. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me? If you don't know anybody that's lost, you're not getting out enough. How many of you do not know a lost person? You don't know anybody that doesn't know Jesus. All of us do. You know what that means? We're responsible. We're responsible. He might not. (laughs) My son's back there. He doesn't know Jesus yet either. Amen. Y'all pray for him. He needs Jesus bad. Amen. We all do. We all do. Amen. He's going to turn five on Friday. Or, yeah, Friday. Turn five on Friday. So far, he's the, the oldest one that's not even talked about it. Sidney was talking about it at this age. Tyson was talking about it at this age. He, he knows about it, but he, he doesn't know about it yet. Amen. So y'all pray for him. Amen. We're praying for him. What do we believe? What does it practically look like to be an independent Baptist? We believe in ecclesiastical separation. We believe in personal sanctification. We believe in evangelistic soul winning. Number four, we believe in an emphasis on Scripture. An emphasis on Scripture. We believe that the scriptures are our ultimate authority and therefore we believe that we must have the right Bible. What's a trademark of an independent Baptist? Unfortunately, in this new independent Baptist age, uh, we're throwing some of the doctrine of the Bible out. We don't necessarily believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of scripture anymore. We do. But some churches say that, well, we believe that it was true in its, in its original languages and now anything goes. Guess what? If it, was, if it had to be true in its original language, then it needs to be true in its translation too. And if, every man sh- if, we, if man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, then we need an every word Bible. We need to make sure that the Bible has been translated 
properly. We do strive. We do believe that it's valuable to fight and make sure we have the proper text of the Word of God. We do believe that it's important that we have an every word Bible. We do believe that the translation to whatever language we're ministering to is accurate as to what the original language intended. We do have missionaries that went to Croatia and didn't have a valid or a proper translation to work with. And so they said, if nobody else is going to do it, let's find somebody to help us. And they started witnessing the Croatian people and they started working towards the end of, of, of translating the Bible. It took them about 20 years. But they got the Bible done and they're still working on making sure that it's pure and making sure that it's right. And they said, well, some people would say we don't really have the, the ability or the credibility to make this happen. But they said we need to have something that we give to the hands of the people that we're ministering to that lines up with the word of God. I'm not, I, look, I don't know who's qualified to make sure that Bible translations are correct in some of these languages, but there probably just needs to be somebody who says, we need to make sure we have something to give to our people. But we don't have to worry about it in, in English. We've already, we've already gone through it all. We don't need to change it. The Bible doesn't need to be rewritten. It needs to be reread. It doesn't need to be uh, f figured out how we can make it more palatable. It needs to be something that we continue to preach the truth of. We believe that the Bible is the word of God and God has not, is not the author of confusion, that God does not have you know, 37 different versions that are needed in English. Hey Amen, you, you don't have to like it. But we believe that there's an emphasis on Scripture. We also believe that not only should we worry about that the Bible is actually correct that we read from and that we, that we, that we preach from, but we also believe that the Bible literally and principally states what we are to live by. And we shouldn't just say, hey, I'm a Bible believer and i got to make sure I have a certain kind of Bible. But we ought to say that with this kind of Bible and with this being a Bible believer, I'm actually going to be a Bible liver. I'm going to live according to the Word of God. I'm going to let God lead me and guide me by His Word. I want to live right by the Bible. We also want to preach right by the Bible. We want to preach line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We want to preach according to the context of the Word of God. We want to make sure that we're not handling the Word of God deceitfully. We want to make sure that we're rightly dividing the Word of truth. We want to make sure that we're continuing the things we have learned and has been assured of. We want to make sure that we're taking the same things that we were handed and we're handing on the same things to the next generation. We want to make sure that we have an emphasis on Scripture. The Bible is God's Word. But we are to shun profane and vain babblings that will increase into more ungodliness and study to show ourselves approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to be having an emphasis on Scripture. If we claim the Scripture but we don't live the Scripture, then we're not very good Bible believers. And if we're not good Bible believers, let's take the name off the sign because we're not Baptists. You know what? I'm okay with some churches taking Baptists off the sign because they stopped being Bible believers a long time ago. Number five, what does it look like practically to be an independent fundamental Baptist church? We believe not only in ecclesiastical separation, personal sanctification. We not only believe in evangelistic soul winning. We not only believe in an emphasis on scripture, but we believe that there is still a call to surrender and sell out to God. We believe that the people of our churches ought to be looking for an opportunity to serve God. And even if God would call them into full-time service, that they would still go. I think that we live in an age where most of us seemingly live for ourselves. There's not a whole lot of people that are saying, God called me to preach and I want to go to the mission field. There's not a whole lot of people saying that anymore. I don't know there's ever been a lot of people saying that, but there needs to be more and we need to reach another generation. And there's more people living now than there's ever been living in the earth before. And so we need more preachers, not less. We need more people to surrender and sell out to God and not less. We believe that the Bible teaches we're to make disciples and reproduce ourselves. And we believe in the call of God to preach and that God still separates people for the work of the ministry. We still ask for people to consider to dedicate and consecrate their lives to gospel ministry. We still want our young people to live their lives for the Lord and not to view their lives as their own. We started out reading tonight, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. It's a good thing to want to serve God with your life. It's a good thing to say, here am I, send me. It's a good thing to say, Lord, what will thou have me to do? I'm sick and tired of a generation of people that say, I don't know, I think I can serve myself and still serve God on the side. Look, I am not against bivocational ministry. A lot of us do it. 
I'm not talking about, well, I'm going to serve God. The only way I'm going to serve is on full time in a church. You might never be a full time in a church, but you should still serve God full time. Okay, I'm enjoying it. Number six, and I'll be done. What does it mean practically to be an independent fundamental Baptist church? We believe that there's a responsibility to send. A responsibility to send. We believe it is our responsibility as a church to send representatives of either those from our church or those of another church that we will get behind to preach the gospel around the world. Now, we did see Marty and Heather Montgomery leave this church and go to Springfield and start a church, and we're grateful for that opportunity to, to be, their, be their home church. Practically speaking, they went with uh, Faith Baptist Church in Bourbon A as their sending church. That's where Marty grew up, and they were able to just handle their finances and different things like that for them. They have some secretaries, and so they used them as their sending church. But they wanted us to realize that we were the ones that had invested in their lives and discipled them to a place that they wanted to start a church. And, and so on their prayer cards, on, on where they went around, they said, this is our home church. We're from Foundation Baptist Church of, of McHenry County, and we're grateful to go forth from this place and start another church. Marty will be here on our 10-year anniversary and he'll preach for us. I'm grateful. They've been there almost five years down in Springfield and they've seen the Lord do a great work, but it was, it's our responsibility as a church to send forth laborers into the harvest. We're supposed to pray to that end. Jesus said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. And we're supposed to see people that'll get saved, get baptized, get trained, and go forth. We believe that the local church can produce servants for the living God. We don't believe that we have to send everybody from a local church to a Bible college. We believe that we can raise them up right here. I'm not against Bible colleges. I went to Bible college. But I believe that if we can't train somebody in the local church, then we're not being a very good church. It's our responsibility to send. Not all the missionaries we support are sent from our church. But we do join in partnership with missionaries who are sent out of other churches of like faith and practice for the furtherance of the gospel and that we may sow into the ministry of those who are going where we cannot practically go so that both they that sow and they that reap may rejoice together. One of the things about being an independent Baptist church and not being part of a convention is that we do choose our own missionaries to support. Now, there is a Southern Baptist Convention, there's an American Baptist Convention, and they're the ones who kind of establish who the missionaries are, and then all the churches just send money towards providing for those missionaries. But as an independent fundamental Baptist church, we get to support to missionaries that we handpick. Tonight, we're going to pass these out in just a few minutes, and as members of a church, we're going to choose two missionaries to take on and four missionaries to increase their support. And we get to do that as an independent church. Now, all the money that we send to them will be a blessing to them. But all the money that we send to them can't support them completely. And so they have other churches of like faith and practice who also do the same thing. And they have multiple people in multiple places praying for them rather than just here. Here's your handbook. Here's the people that convention uh, supports. And these are the people that your money goes to. And now pray for them. No, they don't even know the people. They've never been to their church. They've never, they've never met them personally. We get to do that. That's one of the blessings of being an independent Baptist church. And so we handpick and we vet our own missionaries. We choose who to support. We choose to what extent we'll support them. We don't have to take on any of these, and we don't have to increase the support of any of these. We could take on more, we could take on more missionaries with less support and just pray for more. But I believe that we ought to be practical about things too. $50 was the, with the average that people supported churches for, or missionaries for, you know, 25, 30 years ago. We got to do a little bit better now. Does $50 go as far for you as it did 10 years ago? Don't you wish that $50 would do just as much as today as it did in the year 2000? What, you guys weren't even born yet, were you? Barely, you know. Some, some of y'all so little, so young. The year 2000, I was, I, was a, I was a high school graduate. Some of y'all were like, you know, married with kids grown. <laughs> Listen, we all can look back and say, boy, there were some times when $50 went farther. Now it doesn't go as far anymore, so we want to increase the support of some of our missionaries. 
In a practical way, we'd like to take all the missionaries that we support at $50 a month and bring all of them up to $100 right now, but we can't. But the missionaries that we're going to take on tonight, we'll start supporting them at $100 a month. We'll take four of the other missionaries that we support right now at $50 a month and increase their, their support to $100 a month. But we should continue to pray just as much for everybody as we always have. But we are to be a people of supplication, a people of, of sending Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad for that verse? Whosoever. Are you a whosoever? And did you call upon the name of the Lord? And you're saved. Aren't you glad? Amen. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free. There's, 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 not, there's not a Greek or a Roman. There's not anybody of any nationality or race that God does not love and He does not offer His salvation to. Whosoever. We thank God for that. But then how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? You can't get saved until you first believe. And how should they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how can you believe if you've never heard who he is? And how should they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be saved? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. In 2009... My wife and I traveled for about seven months trying to raise some awareness and support and prayer support for this church to get started. When all was said and done, we had about 21 supporting churches that would send us some finances on a monthly basis to try to help this church get started. We had a sending church, Central Baptist Church of Jefferson City, Missouri, and they got behind us and they helped us to come here and get started. We had other churches in the area that sent people to try to help us, and we had churches in, and a conglomeration of churches that called themselves Reseeding Illinois, and they, they joined together and put some money together so that they could pay for the printed materials that we would need. But this church would not have gotten started if it was not for other churches that believed that they were responsible to send people to tell the truth of the gospel. And there are other churches around the world that will not get started unless we determine to be responsible to send. Send the gospel. Send the light. Send, send the prayers. Send the money. and Send the people. We've got to send. And so what does it mean for us to be an independent fundamental Baptist church? It means that we believe that what God has said in his word is absolutely true and we still need to live by it today. You know, it's a different world that we live in. But people are still the same. God is still the same. I know that people seemingly are worse than they were, but man, wickedness has always been among us. But God's always been the same, and his word is the same. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. We believe that. If we don't believe that, let's just hang it up and go home. There's no reason for us to be here if we're not going to live it. In the next few minutes, I hope that you have prayed this week, the last week and a half or so since we started talking about it, about missionaries we need to take on for support. It's important for us. And we, don't, we, we did not have a missions conference this year. We haven't had a missions conference in a few years. I believe we're going to change that next year because I think we need to have a focus and an emphasis on missions. Even if it seems like it costs a lot of money, it doesn't seem like we're raising the support that we should, we still need to keep an emphasis on missions. People need to hear the gospel around the world. But it's been said that, the, that a missions conference is the church gathering together and having a business meeting about what we're going to do about the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the destiny of the lost. Now, I didn't send out cards to anybody and ask you to donate more money to missions. That's on you. God can speak to your heart about that. But we do have some names right here of people that need to be supported. Some people that have been faithful. The, the, none, none of these, except for one. One missionary that we have an opportunity to take on for support is a brand new missionary. The rest of them have been laboring for years. Years. Faithfully. These other missionaries that we are looking to increase their support, they have been laboring faithfully as even uh, missionaries that we support for years. But we need to do better. And so I encourage us as God's people to get involved, to dedicate ourselves to say, Lord, if you want me to go, I'll go. And if you don't want me to go, I want to send. 
I want to be involved in, in donating and praying so that others might go and so that others might be reached. You realize that if we spend all of our money on ourselves, we live our lives for ourselves, we're not involved in the work of the church, then when we get to heaven someday, we're going to have a loss of rewards of what we could have had. And we're going to wish that we had done more. By and by, when I look on his face, beautiful face, thorn-shadowed face, by and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more, more, so much more, more of my love than I e'er gave before. By and by, when I look on his face, I wish I'd given him more. We have an opportunity to do more tonight. That's what it means to practically be an independent fundamental Baptist, to do more. We're not just trying to fit in. We're not going with the status quo. We're not trying to be the church downtown that has uh, some sort of credibility and, and is the, the trendy place to go. We're trying to make a difference. Whether anybody else appreciates it or not, we're looking to stand before the Lord someday. We're not trying to be the most popular church in town. We're trying to be the most biblical church in town. Now, I'm okay with being popular. I want people to come. I want this place filled. I want to see us have to go to two or three services on a Sunday just to get people in. I'm okay with that. But if not, let's just stay faithful. And so right now, I only want members to take these. But I'm going to pass these out. Brother Jason, you come help me. Brother Al, you come help me if you can. Your feet, your feet feeling good? Your feet feeling good? You walking around good? Okay, good. Just making sure. I didn't want to, you, you, well, no, I didn't know you had three problems there, just making sure. Um, pass these out. If, you, if you're a member, just raise your hand, and we want to make sure that we get this out. We want to make sure that we get these done. Missionaries to take on for support. Uh, we saw these pictures, they're out there um, in the foyer. Uh, we, we, we saw them over the last week. Some of you didn't remember some of these folks, uh, but hopefully you've looked at the pictures, hopefully you've prayed. Hopefully you visited their websites and you have, you have contemplated who we should take on for support. There are missionaries here um, that we've not yet supported that have uh, ministered to us in the past. Andy and Jill Schultz came uh, at a, a stewardship conference that we had in January, I believe, of 2016. January of 2016, they were here. <coughs> They've been faithful in Zambia for about 25 years. They've raised their children on the mission field. They have been faithfully serving God. Global Baptist Church Planners was established as an opportunity to partner with uh, independent Baptist missionaries who are in the foreign field and the, the men that they handpick and they are willing to vet and back that will, that will uh, start churches. And we would be able to take on Global Baptist Church Planners and be responsible for a church to be founded and started every two years. We'd have a church that was started basically, not, not, we wouldn't be the sending pastor, they'd have their sending pastor there in the foreign field, say it was the Philippines or Argentina or wherever it might be, they're going to have a missionary that backs them and sends them, but we would be responsible for making sure that their needs are met on a monthly basis. Rob and Grace Robido are in the closed country of Nepal, ministering uh, in an area that is uh, very, very minimally Christian. It's, 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 it's against the law for them to go out and evangelize, and yet they do it anyways. And they saw people saved even this weekend in their church services. Keith and Jamie Putnam are the only uh, rookie missionaries that are on this. They're on their way to the country of Brazil. They were just with us a couple months ago. Then we have missionaries to increase their support. We've been supporting these missionaries now for several years at $50 a month. We'd like to take four of them and increase that uh, support to $100 a month. So we've got Matt and Heather Gansmer, our missionaries in Argentina. They were with us this summer, and they, they reported to us of their work there. Josh and Sonia Poss also were with us this summer, and they're going back to Ecuador. They've been working in a ministry there, a school, uh, a, a deaf ministry, and they're going to go and start another church and a deaf ministry in that church and try to see another church established for the cause of Christ in Ecuador. 
Peter and Elizabeth Putney. Um, the last time that they were with us, it was also downstairs, so it must have been the end of 2017, somewhere in, in the fall of 2017. They were here with us, and uh, Brother Putney sang for us, and he preached a message on faith. I don't know if you remember that. He sang with a guitar. And he didn't have the greatest singing voice, but you know what? You just know he loves God, and man, he is doing a job. He started his second church already in just about four years on the mission field. He loves people. He loves, he loves the Lord. And, and he, even though, even though the, the, the Catholics of Columbia are trying to get him kicked out, even though the drug cartels don't want him to be there, he just continues to serve. And he's just raising up a family for God. And serving God with them. Josiah and Courtney Jones, they'll be uh, coming back this year for a furlough. They'll be coming and reporting to us sometime in the next uh, eight months or so. But they're uh, missionaries with us, or for, for us in Mexico. And they've been there for several years now. They're going to go back and start another church uh, when they finish their furlough. Phil and Monica Tharp are in Ireland. And they've started a church in, in a, a, country, a town called Drogheda, I think is how you say it. And uh, they've, been, they've been establishing an independent fundamental Baptist church there in a highly Catholic country, Ireland. Then in Samantha Jordan, uh, Brother Jordan was working alongside another missionary. And while they were doing a youth conference, a VBS type of a thing, they, th several of them went into the ocean to swim and the other missionary drowned trying to save a young man's life. And Brother Jordan has taken over the church and is trying to see that church established so that a national pastor can come along and take it and he can start another church and start Bible colleges and things like that. They're seeing a lot of people in the Dominican Republic who... Um, uh, are coming to Christ and getting saved who have families, but they've never been married. And he's been teaching them on marriage and teaching them on, on how to be biblically correct in their, in their families. And he's seeing a lot of people, uh, th their lives changed right now. Jared and Bernadette Montgomery. This is Marty, and, uh, Marty Montgomery's brother. Uh, they are now in Puerto Rico. They were there laboring uh, during a time of another missionary that went on a furlough. And then that missionary was going to retire. And they're effectively taking a church and striving to uh, see it grow and go on for the cause of Christ and establish a ministry there in the country of Puerto Rico. These are, these are, these are missionaries who are doing the job. And we want to be able to help them as much as we can. And so all I've asked is for you to pray and for you to check the boxes or to check the lines that you believe that we should take on Two missionaries to take on for support. I wish we could take them all on. I wish that we could raise and increase the support of all these others, but we need to do what we can while we can. The time is short. The Lord's coming back. I don't know when he's coming back. Even if he doesn't come back for another 200 years, the time is short. It's shorter than it's ever been. Amen? So we need to do our job. And so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask me, you don't need to put your name on the top or anything like that. Just check the missionaries too to take on for support and four to increase support. We'll, we'll bring that in. We'll count that up tonight and we'll let, let you know uh, this next week who we were able to take on, okay? And so let's do that. Let's pray. We'll, we'll effectively close the service by doing this and then um, we'll just hand these in to the center aisle. Brother Jason, you'll pick all these up in just a few minutes and then we'll count these up uh, after the service, okay? Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be a part of a local church. And we have this opportunity to send missionaries. Lord, we're grateful for the ecclesiastical separation that we see in the scriptures, that we should be doctrinally sound, that we should not yoke up with those that are not doctrinally sound. We thank you that even though sometimes it's difficult to live holy and righteous lives, you have instructed us and we're accountable to each other to live personally and, and uh, sanctified and separated. Lord, help us to walk in truth. Help us to live lives uh, that, that represent you well. Lord, we're thankful for uh, all the practical aspects of being a part of a church, but Lord, it's our job to be witnesses. We're supposed to be soul winners, and we're supposed to reach the world, not just at home, but abroad. And so, Lord, help us as we send others in our place. Help us to uh, get behind the right missionaries. Lord, it, it's, it's, it's shocking, but it's, it's true that there are times when even missionaries are not true to the, to the Word of God and they're not true to what they portray 
as they travel around. So Lord, we only want to take on those that we believe would be a, a wise investment of our missions money. Lord, we want to be able to get behind them with confidence that they will uh, effectively serve you and, and follow you and that they will preach the word of God with boldness and conviction, that they will not uh, fall away, and Lord, that they will not give themselves over to sin. Lord, we know that all of us are capable of that, but Lord, we definitely want to be behind the right missionaries. And so, Lord, we've been praying this week, and we've been asking you to direct our steps and that we would take on the missionaries that we should and that we would increase the support of the missionaries that we should. And so, Lord, I do ask that you would help us tonight uh, to um, see this take place, that it would be effective the way that we've decided to do this for the first time and that we would be able to, uh, with confidence and with excitement, see uh, those that we prayed for be taken on for support. Lord, that you would take and use this money. Lord, I know that it's, it's not a lot in the grand scheme of what they might need for a month, but Lord, it's, it's what we can give to them. And so, Lord, that it would be a blessing to them and that they would able, be able to use it and that it would go to the furtherance of the gospel. And Lord, that they would be wise stewards of these finances. Lord, we do ask that you would help us to choose the right ones. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. Yet with you, we know that there's nothing that's impossible. And so, Lord, please uh, bless now as we make this vote. Please encourage our hearts and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.